Hi, this is Margaret Maloney, and welcome to the Death Dhamma Podcast. Together, we will consider life, death, and impermanence. Because in between birth and death, we lose things, not just our glasses and our keys. We lose identities, relationships, ideas, and more. But what we can gain right now is facing this together, and we will gain freedom, peace, and and progress on our path. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Today, I have the honor and the pleasure of speaking with Sophie Jacobs. And she has a lot of wisdom to share with us about impermanence and intuition and how things flow in life. And I think that she's the best one to expand on that. So I'm going to ask her to do that right now. So welcome, Sophie. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much, Margaret, for for allowing me to to kind of step into your cultivated space of impermanence. Um, I would say that this, I mean, I'm not really sure where this journey or when this journey started, but really it came to kind of an impetus or the wheels started turning about a couple of years ago, kind of right when COVID hit in a sense. I was part of the, the class of 2020, mm-hmm. graduating class then, and we had our you know whole semester upended, didn't have a graduation, and at the time, I wasn't really sure what I was going to be doing, and I was also very much interested in meditation and Buddhism just kind of particularly resonated with me, mm-hmm. and then through a, a series of many losses and like a loss of relationship, loss of the timeline in terms of graduation, loss of my house, loss of my job. Uh, I decided to really ask myself what's most important. And that kind of led me into around 10 months staying at a Buddhist monastery. uh, Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so I would say that all of those, those deaths in my life kind of brought me back to this central question of like, what really matters? Mm -hmm. Um, And then secondly, like, what, what do I know to be true in my heart, apart from kind of the noise, apart from like any sort of dogma or Mm -hmm. how do I trust what is no, what is true for me um, in this moment? So that's a little bit of, of my backstory. Wow. Thank you. Okay. So let's just do a quick recap first. What a thing I want everyone to know is that even though this is a podcast, so you are all listening right now, as I am recording, I can see her and she is just smiling and beaming all these things that she has gone through, which is a lot. She is able to stand here and smile as she shares her experiences with us today, because like, let's just do a quick recap of what I've picked up so far is that she was graduating. Things were going to be a certain way. I think as we all think when we graduate, we we may have uncertainty about our career path, but we have a thought like, I'm going to graduate. I'm going to get this kind of job. I'm going to go to my graduation ceremony, which that wasn't even something you got to do, right? I'm going to celebrate with my friends. Also, you didn't get to do that. And I'm going to set off on this path. And then you just very casually mentioned And by the way, you lost your home and the breakup of a relationship. So basically, if you like magic and you see a magician do that trick on the table where they pull the the cloth out, (laughs) so like somebody just pulled the tablecloth or actually the right phrase is really someone pulled the rug right out from her feet, Mm -hmm. right out from her feet and leading to a questioning of, well, what matters? Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say it that way? Yeah, absolutely, Margaret. And, you know, something that came up to me when you were saying that the pull of the the rug or like the everything just being upended, something that I remember from that experience of, let's say, losing my home, that particular mm-hmm. experience, I actually was home alone and I left a couple hours before the fire would completely destroy my home. Oof. It was an intuitive impulse. This was a nudge that I just felt it was not coming from, um, Cal fire, which I'm, you know, my home was in Northern California. So it wasn't coming from any sort of news source or Mm -hmm. 
authority. It was more so this subtle sense that, yeah, something is off. Okay. Plus that. And particularly there was a book that I brought with me in my backpack. That was the mm-hmm. only thing I brought other than uh, my, my dog's treats. Um, okay. <laughs> and your dog, I guess you took your dog. Yes. You so I yes. had two dogs. I brought them with me and okay. I brought a box of like their leashes and treats and food. And then uh-huh. my backpack. that was the only, only stuff I brought. But in that backpack, there was a book by Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, and you want to know what the book is called? Yes, I do. We all do. Yes, yes. please. Your true home. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I'm understanding that. So I'm so sorry, because you lost your home in one of the big fires that we've had over the last couple of years. And in California, everyone, I think the world knows this, but in California now, it's always fire season. Yeah. This is what we've learned. But you lost your home. But it wasn't at the moment that you decided to leave with your backpack and your dogs you weren't officially being evacuated. You were responding to an internal feeling. Is that what I'm understanding? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the intuition mm-hmm. was you need to go and you need to go now. Yep. And, and so you, you know, did. Yeah, Margaret. And that was just a major catalyst for me because at the time I, I had a couple months before that I had ended a relationship that mm-hmm. from the beginning, I knew within my heart that it was not aligned like this was not the person for me. And yet I couldn't trust that. So Mm -hmm. there was so many things in my life that I was doing that felt kind of like going down a prescriptive route that I was supposed to. And that moment of just trusting myself, that small sense of, you know what, maybe I should leave really upended my whole life. Like it I would argue that it saved my life because a couple people on my street actually ended up dying. Oh, so it really was one of those moments of like, what if I hadn't have trusted that? Exactly. What if I hadn't have looked within and, and truly trusted what my body was sending me? And so that felt like a really important thing to discover mm-hmm. and to within myself because I knew before that I was not understanding of it. I wasn't exploring it. And okay. most importantly, I wasn't trusting it. So do you think this was one of the first times that you really listened to the call of your intuition? Because I'm guessing other times in your life, you've had the call. We are often, I think it's getting better now in life, but I, we are often discouraged. At least I was years yeah. ago, discouraged from heeding the call, talking about the call, acknowledging the call. I see more in today's world of acknowledging it. However, I am curious, was this like the first time that you really paid attention to that knowing? I would say no. Okay. Uh, So you've had other experiences where you, you know, it's the kind of thing where like, I can only say that in retrospect, I'm not sure I would have been able to give you that answer at the time that I had answered the call. Right. What we'll say is that following that that call that nudge that intuitive impulse at the time right before the fire hit that was one of the times that really like woke me up from okay um this this habitual sense of like outsourcing my information Mm -hmm. Um, so so it was a wake-up call in a sense but I don't think that that was like the one time that I decided to follow it it just happened to be that the one, this one time that I decided to follow it ended up saving my life yes, and, and causing just such a, a ripple effect on my life. Yes. And saving you, like you said, most likely from death because sadly, and unfortunately people did die in the fire and people on your street died in the fire, but you also have dealt with, when I say the little D I'm not making light of the, the losses you've experienced in your life. I use that comparatively to talk about the parts of impermanence that prepare us along the path, because ultimately there's the death, you know, where I, I stopped breathing. You've had, you had these series of these deaths, deaths of ideas, deaths of relationships, deaths of your home. And then at some point you decide to take some, if I'm interpreting this correctly, you decide to take some time out 
and go stay in a monastery and sit with all of this. Mm-hmm. Is that, is it fair to say it that way? Yeah. Like yeah. how long after the loss of the home did you say, I think I'm going to go figure this stuff out? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because at the time I was actually at a, a highly regarded startup position. Um, one of my friends built her own companies. And over the summer that year, this was back in uh, summer of 2020. I got a random text from my friend saying, hey, would you want to work at my startup? And that just kind of set the chain reaction for Mm -hmm. doing that. So I had a job that most people would, I don't want to say die for, but I really, really want, really, like really compete heavily for. Yes, exactly. I was basically like the, the, chief operating officer of this company without having any business experience. It was one of those like crazy experiences that just mm-hmm. kind of landed at my lap. And I felt sure. like at the time, well, this is such a big opportunity. I should just take it. This when I say I should like, yes, that's, I, a, that's a key I, phrase, isn't it? That should thing. Key phrase because I was like, anyone would kill for this job. I'm going to be learning so much. Like I had so many ways that I could explain to myself why it would be a good idea. I had Mm -hmm. a mental checklist that I could go through and rationalize my way into this job. But once the fire hit, um, there was a specific moment when I knew I could not do this job anymore. And Mm -hmm. it was a couple days after the fire hit, um, my friend who is the, the CEO of the company, she asked me to, to take a call with someone from, like someone who is applying for a position. Okay. And so my friend was asking me all of these things, like nearly days after I lost my home. For me, I was like, this is, this is not okay. Like, I don't feel supported. Because of the, if I may ask, is it because of that expectation of like, well, okay, Sophie, just return back to business now. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, you lost your home. Get back to work. Yeah. I mean, it it wasn't acknowledging my humanity. And in many ways, it just felt like part of this toxic hustle culture that of like this sense that you have to be constantly productive and that you can't just take a step back. But more so than that, it was like, I just had this sense that my life energy was not aligning with this job. No matter how much I gave in, I wasn't getting anything back in a sense. So and it felt so, wrong. It felt off. It felt off. It felt wrong in, mm-hmm. in almost a similar way that my relationship did. It just, it was not aligned. And so the fire really was the impetus to quit my job. And so- okay. Long story short, to answer your question, I quit my job about a week after the fire. Okay. And um, I stayed, you know, at, in Tahoe for a while, mm-hmm. uh, a couple of weeks. And then I stayed at my sister's one, you know, my, my sister's studio apartment in Denver for a month. And then right afterwards, I went back to California to the monastery. Okay. And so while you were, I guess, so while you were in Denver and you're on top of each other in this studio apartment, good <laughs> sisters, good loving sisters, <laughs> testing your sisterly relationship, the, something bubbled up for you, I'm thinking, to the call to go take this time of reflection and contemplation. Yeah. You know what it was, Margaret? I, I felt like I was in this liminal space, like okay. I was straddling two different realities that I had the ability to choose between. So on the one hand, I was actually looking for different jobs that maybe would have been more aligned with me. Okay. I I was figuring out, okay, maybe I could take this more traditional route. Um, So I was, you know, doing that. And then I was also like making a spreadsheet of different monasteries across the U S and, you know, Oh, them just, so I was putting my, my energy in like two different places. That's so interesting. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. So on the one hand, you're doing a job search, but then you're also doing a contemplation search Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at the same time. Okay. So tell me, tell us more about like, so how did the, how did the search for the monastery 
for lack, pardon this expression, win <laughs> over the job search? Um, to be quite honest with you, it won because I, uh, I got rejected from a job. <laughs> okay. So, well, you know what? Eventually. It is what it is, right? We've I, all been rejected from many things. I sit before you as a person who's been rejected from many things in life. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I think that rejection was probably the greatest gift I could have been given. I knew, and this was regardless of if I was going to go to the monastery at the time or not, I mm -hmm. knew that I wanted to have that experience at the monastery. I just didn't know if it was the right time, but then sure. something in me, I think this was right around October. Cause I went to the monastery in November. Something in me was like, if not now, then when? Like, uh -huh. if not now, then when? Like, you, everything is kind of falling apart in your life mm -hmm. and is creating this huge open space for you. And so if not now, when? Like, there's always going to be the next thing that's preventing you from doing an experience like this. I felt deeply that I wanted to do something like this, mm -hmm. but I also felt this desire kind of like this clinging on to security of like what clinging on to all of the shoulds. Of yes. You should yes. make money. I should start, you know, cultivating my work life and my identity as a person in their twenties. Yeah, right. And this is what a person is, or we become yeah. career people or. Yeah. So there was this, there was this internal struggle that I was facing in that liminal mm -hmm. space. I bet. Wow. Yeah. And it just, you know, out of chance, I ended up going to the monastery, which I'm deeply grateful for, but yeah, it, it wasn't that I was extremely courageous and decided all of a sudden, okay, you know what, I'm going to the monastery. It actually, it took a lot of like internal struggle to, to get to that place. Well, I think you sell yourself short because I think whether it feels, whether it felt like courage or not, I, the courage to go against the stream you know, and I don't know what your friends and family were saying to you, you know, when we talk about the should conversations, but because you did something that we, we may say unconventional, right? It could be that some of the people you were communicating with were like, of course, you should just go get your next job. You know, I mean, I remember a time years ago when I had a very big job loss and the feedback from the people who loved me and wanted good things for me was basically, you know, that story of get back on the horse. Yep. Yep. And, uh huh. <laughs> so I'm wondering, you know, that maybe there were. So I think you, I think you did show courage, absolutely, because you, you, you took the different path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's okay. It's okay to be just you. If you. I get being modest that you don't want to say it for yourself. So I guess I'm saying it for you. I feel that you were courageous, and so off to the monastery you went. And had you ever been on a meditation retreat or anything like that before this? Yes. Oh, that's so, good. That's good. Cause yeah, I would still think it's a, I would imagine there was some adjustment that went on for you, huh? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So back in, I, I started like a meditation routine. I, I would say back in college, mm -hmm. um, during my sophomore year, the second semester of my sophomore year and back in my senior year of college. So this was just like a year prior I had become very deeply interested in meditation um, and I had a consistent practice. And so I was starting to do like weekend retreats and I went to IMS um, Insight Meditation Center in Barrie, Massachusetts, which was pretty close to my school. Awesome. Um, I went to one of their retreats and then I started a peer led meditation group at my school because we, we just didn't have one. And wow. Okay. Crazy to me that like there wasn't a space to meditate together on my campus amidst like this stress culture and this pervasive sense that we couldn't slow down. Um, yeah. Yeah. Keep wanted, going, keep producing more and more. Yeah. I definitely wanted to challenge that. So I felt like something was building momentum. I kept on, you know, my practice. I, I slowly started to go to more retreats. They weren't very long retreats, but it was enough where I felt like I just want to 
continue getting deeper and deeper into this. And also I, I don't want this just to be like a solo practice. I want community out of this. And so I think that was kind of the, the impetus, part of the impetus of like, I, I want to experience what it's like to be at a monastery. And <laughs> I actually remember, so at the monastery, it was during COVID and mm-hmm. the only way I could actually be part of the monastery was to do a two week quarantine in their backyard. They had like a little yurt. Okay. So I actually turned it into a two week meditation retreat. And absolutely. Was- like that's your introduction yeah. right there to that's monastic right. life. That's right. And so like, that was one of the, the first times where I really spent, um, a long time in retreat. And I actually remember saying the day I got out of it and entered into the community, I said, I think I learned more in that two weeks than I have probably in the past four years of college. Wow. That is a very powerful statement. And can you share a little bit about what that means and why you feel that way? I would say that understanding your mind without using thinking is a process of knowing that I had never been exposed to before in my education. It was almost like a systematic deconstruction or like a opening into what it means to know things as they are. I had been so stuck in like the cognitive realm of knowing, Mm -hmm. like finding the perfect definition for a concept or like, like one of my mentors likes to say mental masturbation, where you just start to like proliferate on these thoughts and, and get super inspired, but you're still stuck in the realm of thinking, right? Thinking can ultimately liberate you. But I think what the, the retreat was teaching me was that there's something, there's something liberating and taking a step back like an observer's view and that that insight I could only have done it by doing it you know like I couldn't yes. myself through it and so you I had to be with yourself had you had to, to be with it myself. exactly mm-hmm. yeah and I, I think there's something about just taking the time to steep in your own silence and the silence around you that insights just naturally arise because things are settling and the true nature of mind and world start to kind of come into the forefront and clear. It's almost like through meditation, you start to like clean the mind in a way and, and get rid of kind of the pollution so that things become clear to you. It's and like, so- uh, I feel like as you're talking, I'm thinking like it was like this great prep work, so to speak, that you did preparing <laughs> yourself to enter this community. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's like your conditioning. It was your conditioning in a way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I don't know that the play, the monastery you stayed at always does this. Like you said, it was, you know, kind of a COVID quarantine thing. But as you're speaking, I'm thinking maybe that's just a general good practice for people who want to come and join the community for a length of time as you did, that maybe it's a good idea to do a, a, a self silent meditation ahead of time to get ready, to get mm-hmm. ready for this different lifestyle. Maybe that's a way to, I'm not going to say ease into it because it's not easy. So it's not, <laughs> ease is not the right word. Um, I, I guess I'm going to just stick with prepare, prepare. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you on that one. It, mm-hmm. it did make the transition a lot easier for me having had that time. And it, it was in the way of like, when I heard the teachings and I interacted with people, like their presence or the words, the mm-hmm. energy behind the words actually became clear to me once I had spent time with myself in meditation. So it was able to be understood at, at a more deeper level. So can you describe for us a little bit of, so once you entered into the community, a little bit about what your daily routine was like? Yeah. So um, at the monastery I was at, this was a female monastery in the Theravada mm-hmm. tradition. And what we did was woke up or waking up at, let's say 4.30. We okay. had meditation at five from five to five 30. And then we had chanting from about five 30 to six 30. Mm-hmm. Um, and then because I was a volunteer at the time, I was tasked with 
uh, kitchen managerial duties. So that meant okay. I, <laughs> at, at 6.30 a.m. I helped prepare breakfast. Breakfast was at seven. And then by 8 a.m. we were having a community work meeting around you know, news around the monastery and also just work, work tasks. And mm -hmm. generally like checking in with how we were feeling. And then from about 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. was work, our kitchen prep. So I was tasked with um, helping make the main meal of the day. Okay. Because in the Theravada tradition, we only have two meals in the day. One yep. And one. all before noon, right? All before noon. All before yep. noon. Yep. That's one of the precepts um, to live at the monastery. You can't eat past noon. So yeah, our main meal was at 11. And then, you know, 12 p.m., 12.30, we started to clean the dishes and just generally do a cleaning of, of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the afternoon, it was more flexible. So you could spend time on your own personal practice or there were different projects going around in the monastery that mm -hmm. weren't so like routine. And that would just be dependent on, on what, what needed to be done. I would often like help cash checks at the bank or like sure go to their doctor's appointment or put mulch on the you know on the tree whatever needed was so whatever basic needed whatever done. needed to be done right right okay um and then by seven we had our evening meditation for about half an hour and then more chanting and so by 8 p.m we were off to our own devices so we could either uh do our personal practice mm -hmm. or go to bed i bet you were tired though Oh my God. Yeah. Right. I would imagine it went like four 30 comes early. So it's not like you're up till midnight. I would imagine not yeah. purposefully anyway. Right. I think that's one of the misconceptions about going to the monastery is that you're going to have like so much time to yourself, but like, that's not actually super true. At least in my case, it was a lot of time spent doing things for the community and being in community and doing mundane things like sweeping and washing the dishes and driving. Mm -hmm. like we have, I think a lot of, at least Westerners have this view of like a monastery is a place where you just like meditate for 12 hours a day. And right. Like you're just really, like, really, you're meditating and levitating off a cushion all day. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. And I, and I'm sure that like, before I came there, I had some of that idea, <laughs> but that bubble got real, uh, well, yeah, it popped real, real quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had, a, I had probably the similar thought and then a similar experience, uh, because when I do go to stay, I do drop into a, a Theravada monastery and it's almost the exact same schedule that you described and absolutely. And by the time you do your volunteer work, which is lovely. Mm -hmm. um, and so it taught me to think of my volunteer work as a type of meditation, exactly. right? Because you're right. Otherwise you really you don't, you're not sitting all day long. You're just yeah. not because no, not. there are ways in which you're helping, which is great to be able to help. But yeah, I had yeah. the similar experience. Definitely. In a way it's kind of a gift because it, it taught me that meditation doesn't have to just look like sitting in a lotus pose on a cushion. Like right. meditation is so much more expansive than that. And I was really grateful actually to be doing such mundane chores because it gave me the ability to practice in the mundane and to recognize that those mundane moments are actually worth paying attention to. So <laughs> developing, cultivating mindfulness of daily life. And it kind of connects back to like why I wanted to go to the monastery in the first place. Like I had no idea whether I wanted to, you know, ordain, like choose this life for okay. a long time or just to have this experience. I was going in completely unaware of what what it would lead in my life. But I knew one thing that taking that choice was going to build a foundation for me, like almost an impenetrable foundation of mindfulness that I could take it with me wherever I went and that I would never have regretted doing it. So yeah, in a way I actually appreciated how much time was spent, not just like on the cushion, but actually mm -hmm. Doing Actually, participating it. in life in a different way. The yeah. way I think of it sometimes when I go is I'm never this excited about doing dishes at home. <laughs> <laughs> right. But there I'm very happy to be in the kitchen and helping with the dishes and things. And I just laugh at myself. I'm like at home, you're grumbling, which is a good lesson um, for myself. 
to also be with the mundane at home because <laughs> that's right. an opportunity as well. But uh, yes, it's it's. I guess I don't mind the stepping away from what my life looks like outside of, of visiting. And so you got to do that. But so at some point, it seems that you had this experience, but that you decided to come back right. to the world of, of laity, of the lay people, not to become a nun. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So I actually, uh, back in, no, yeah, July 31st of 2021, mm -hmm. I decided to ordain as an anagarika. Uh, okay. If you don't know what that is, it's like a homeless seeker. So it's, it's somewhere between like, a full-time nun mm -hmm. and like well what I would say is it is being a monastic like you are devoting yourself to monastic life but it's almost like a nun in training so I wore right white robes I shaved my head I was given uh, a dhamma name uh, panyatara panya meaning wisdom tara meaning to set free or liberate also star in the sky okay. and for for about three months I lived life as a monastic Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's interesting. People often ask me that question, like, why did I leave? And I want to come back to the fire because it was okay. at that point, again, where I questioned what really matters, number one, but also like what would happen if I trusted myself, uh, uh, trusted my inner knowing. And that second question was really important to me at the monastery because I'm the kind of person that easily gets swayed by other people's thoughts and opinions. And, you know, even my sister told me right before I was about to leave, like she was worried that I was joining a cult, which I was not, but she was worried that like, I would drown out my own knowing with what I was being taught. Oh, and, okay. You would be too receptive to the ideas and influence of others. Right. So I was very wary of that when, you know, when I first came to the monastery, but I also was like, you know what, I'm just going to take this all in because there's no, like, I can't judge this without going fully in. I need to live this life and then I can, you know, figure out if this life is, is meant for me. Right. And right. something that kind of happened during, during my time there was, I honest to God kind of felt like my emotions were dulling or shutting off um, that I wasn't expressing the aliveness that I knew was possible within me. And it was this weird, subtle sense that I was almost turning into this like doll as I ordained, like I, I felt this pressure to be someone that I just couldn't, I didn't feel that was right for me. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't, if we go back to what we started off with, Mm -hmm. not in alignment with who you it really are in alignment. And that this was actually one of the hardest things that I had to face because I thought, well, you know, you're just experiencing so much resistance and you just got to keep going. And I tried to convince myself to follow this path because, you know, w once you're in the community, you're kind of told that like, there is quite a division between lay life and monastic life. Sure. And a lot of, I would say, well-intentioned, but I almost felt like judgment of lay Those of us who live on the outside. Yeah, like they, yes. it, I was told that like lay people are almost like taking a walk down the spiritual path, but monastics are like taking a plane. And so like, it would be better of you to just take a plane rather than take a walk because it's just going to be, I wouldn't say easier, but maybe more effective or more efficient. And I was just told all these stories about, you know, this is such a beautiful path to walk on and um, you're so lucky to like have found it and oh, you're so young and so wise. And it, it almost like inflated my ego to the point where I'm like, am I choosing this because people are telling me that I am this person or am I choosing this because really deeply in my heart, I can feel this is the next step for now. That this is really my path. Yeah. I could see the, the, you know, it just shows you in, in so many things, there's peer pressure, whether it's an intentional or not, there's that peer pressure. And I can, I can see that like the implication you are following this wise path 
you will reach enlightenment more quickly because you are on this path. And therefore, whether somebody said it or not, if you choose something else, you're turning your back on your own enlightenment, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What felt so resonant for me was to take what I had learned and try to integrate it into real life. Like what keeps coming back to me recently as I've been in lay life is this feel it all like really feel it, embody it all. Okay. I think for, for a long time at the monastery, I had tried to be this holy person in a way sure. but that was denying my own vulnerability. And I can't remember who said it, but, you know, a couple days ago, I heard this quote of maybe, maybe I don't want venerable. Maybe I want vulnerable and human. Wow. And that like, Ooh, those words just went deep into my being. And I just felt that so strongly. Maybe it's not about being venerable. Maybe it's about being vulnerable. And so I think the path that I on that I am on is one of like, it's still definitely taking the lessons of the Buddha and the Buddhist teachings, Mm -hmm. but it's more of a path of like surrendering to, to my heart's way in a sense, like to these intuitive impulses and, and recognizing my body is, is a source of wisdom. And, and that maybe like my path doesn't look like the kind of path that like other people see for me either with, you know, Buddhists or with my family. And maybe Mm -hmm. I don't even know what it is yet, but I have to keep trusting that, that pulse. I have to keep trusting that maybe I don't know, but that's completely fine. I find the not knowing this is going to sound odd. Maybe I find the not knowing to be a relief. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I found that as I, as I merged more into Buddhism and as I became a Buddhist, I think something that was really useful to me was getting to a point of things and knowing that I didn't know and that it was not only okay not to know, it was actually maybe desirable not to know, you know, having come from, you know, a corporate world and, you know, you have to know things you can't in theory, you can't be vulnerable. You can't let people know that you don't know things or that's perceived as weak in some corporate cultures. And so this ability to just not know something and to surrender, ah, such a relief. It is such a relief. And it reminds me of something that uh, I think it was a Zen priest, Tenku Rush or Tenku Ruff Osho, I listened to one of her Dharma talks and, and she talked about how the more that she knows, the less space there is for her to actually connect. And the more that she doesn't know, the more space there is for the connection to the entire universe to unfold. That was like a big yes. creation for me that maybe not knowing is the space where we truly connect with this present moment and that sometimes knowing can actually it is a paradox in a way sometimes knowing can actually shield the true knowing of this moment yes I think it comes back to the type of knowing right so if we're talking about having a deep spiritual knowing that's coming from all these things that you're talking about that is one thing but I think that that deep spiritual knowing still comes with that sense of openness Yep. to it not being finite mm-hmm. as opposed to maybe traditional in the outside world where we live knowing which is meant to be more of a a box and a you don't change your knowing unless somebody really you know can prove something and right. you know we tend to think that it's most courageous to stand on our platform and say this is what i know changing. we're supposed to be experts Right. In a corporate world, we're supposed to be experts at something. Exactly. But that literally undermines what is actually happening right now. And, you know, we we really negatively associate people who like change their beliths or like what they know. Mm -hmm. The difference between flip-flopping 
to serve to, to people please and to serve um, an agenda and then changing your what you knew to something that matches or in tune with the reality that you that you're coming aware into right so, being yeah. political I'll use that as an example since that's a thing that happens a lot in today's yeah. world being political versus true growing perhaps mm -hmm. might be a way to express it I think that you are taking all of this that you've been learning and writing or doing something with it is that true yeah that's right when I was at the monastery um I was on retreat in the winter mm -hmm. and there was one night that I said to myself I think I need to write a book about intuition <laughs> it was mm -hmm. literally came out of nowhere but I think because of the context that I was in it was at night it was in the forest I I it was like filled with the silence of the in the spaciousness of that moment that message could really reverberate in my being and so at that time I just thought you know I don't know what this is going to bring, but I'm going to start writing journal posts, journal entries on okay. inner knowing and intuition and everything that, that connects in between. So I made a habit, um, back in March of 2021 to consistently write about that theme. And, you know, along the way, I, you know, I leave the monastery and then I connect with someone who's in a book writing program. And then I join the book writing program and amazing. it's, it's built this really beautiful momentum to where now I'm expecting a book in January of 2023 with the working title of Elemental Knowing. Elemental Knowing? Yep. Awesome. Beautiful. And is there a theme or a teaching that you'd like to give us a little preview of? Yeah, I would say that there is a knowing within us that connects not only to the depths of ourselves, but connects us to nature. And I like to explore that within the four elements. So I kind of use the wind as this connection to spirit, this, this okay. that moves through us, but is largely invisible. And fire as a destructive and purifying force in our lives. Wind as, you know, feeling our emotions and connecting to you know, our intuition, and then the earth kind of grounding in our awareness of our bodies and kind of getting to the root of what's important, kind of using the elements as a structure for getting closer to our bodies and to nature as a whole. So knowing as a connective force, uh -huh. knowing as, as okay. a space where connection unfolds. And that's, that's largely what it's going to be about. And, and kind of the process of trusting that, like, how do we get to the point where we can trust this as something, something to, to work with really. That's beautiful. Is there a teaching or a mantra or a chant that you draw on on a regular basis as you navigate your days? Yeah, that's a really good question. I really love the simplicity of certain teachings and mm -hmm. there's something that I read back in 2019 when I was a senior in college from Bhante Gunaratna who's a Theravada monk uh he wrote mindfulness uh in plain English and he has a he, he just said something in his actually his biography that was about the breath he was talking about the breath as a birth and a death and how becoming mindful of the breath is actually becoming mindful of like the ebb and flow universe. I really love that teaching because it's something that I can connect back to on a moment to moment basis. All that, like the breath is the greatest teacher of impermanence. It comes and it goes and it comes and it goes and it's, it's relentless. We can always tap back into that space. That's really helpful. Thank you. Well, I really admire you and the work you've done and the realizations that you've had and I thank you so much for sharing. And I am looking forward to that book. You've been listening to the Death Dhamma podcast with your host, Margaret Maloney. Thank you so much for being here. Come find me on margaretmaloney.com. M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T-M-E-L-O-N-I.com. And until we meet again, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be at ease, 
and may you be free from suffering. Bye for now.